I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Punks are running wild in the street, and there's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do, and there's no end to it. Hello, my name is Kyle, and for the past 12 years and counting, I have been making videos online as a professional clown. We know. The air is unfit to breathe, and our food is unfit to eat. And like all internet-based clowns, my makeup has been the sloppily applied veneer of serious discussion. We don't need white paint or red noses, just talking heads and a call to comment, like, and subscribe. I also have a Patreon. Thank you very much for your generous donations on Patreon. I really couldn't do this without you. We sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We are here to distract you from the anxiety of being alive in a dying world. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. Now, I know some longtime commenters will be annoyed with me for supposedly putting myself down, diminishing whatever importance they think I have in their lives. But to be perfectly honest, I've run out of bullshit. In the grand context of the world, I am merely an entertainer. Everyone on this tube of yours, from those with 10 subscribers to those with 10 million, are show people. We are in the boredom killing business. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. And for a long time now, I have been haunted. Haunted by another professional boredom killer. A fictional one. Television news anchor, Howard Beale. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. Howard Beale is a fictional character with an oversized impact on the real world. A harbinger of the media landscape that formed over the decades since his debut. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad! In 1976, this fictional news anchor captured the imaginations of a generation. You've got to say, I'm a human being! God damn it! My life has value! And inspired them in the worst possible ways. I want you to get up now. This video was a threnody, a wail, a howl for Howard Beale, who he was, right now, what he stood for, window, how he lives on, and, and why he should be buried. And yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! A lamentation for how we have all become mad as hell and unable to take this anymore. I want you to get up right now. Get up, go to your windows, open them and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not gonna take this anymore. The film network opens with four faces, three of which would have been very familiar to an American audience watching in 1976. Howard K. Smith of ABC, John Chancellor of NBC, and Walter Cronkite of CBS the three head anchors of the three major American television networks. For most of the existence of American television, it was pretty much only those three. There were many attempts to make a fourth rival network, the oldest being Dumont, which folded in 1953. A year later, national educational television would begin broadcasting until 1970, when it was succeeded by the Public Broadcasting Service, which is still on the air today. But the fourth face here represents a fictional network, UBS, whose news department is anchored by our tragic hero, Howard Beale, played by the British-Australian actor Peter Finch. And so Howard Beale is introduced in a losing role, anchor of a channel doomed to fail in its ambitions to rival the established Big Three. Beale is also established as part of the institution of television. I was at CBS with Ed Morrow in 1951. He and his friend Max Schumacher, played by William Holden, are set up as the old guard of television. It's 7 in the morning, I got a call. Where the hell are you? You're supposed to be on the George Washington Bridge. Our narrator has told us that Howard Beale's tenure as UBS news anchor has come to an end. He is a widower without children, now without a job. Jump out of bed, throw my raincoat over my vagina, I run down the stairs, I run out of the street, hail a cab, and I say to the cabbie, Take me to the middle of the George Washington Bridge! Ah! <laughs> and the first conversation in the film, after the opening narration, is a hilarious story about a job mistaken for an attempted suicide. And the cabbie turns around. He says, don't do it, buddy. 
<laughs> You're a young man. You got your whole life ahead of you. <laughs> Suicide hangs over most of the film. I'm gonna myself. I'm gonna blow my brains out right on the air. Right in the middle of the seven o'clock news. Since this show was the only thing I had going for me in my life, I have decided to myself. Get a hell of a rating, I guarantee you that. 50 share, easy. By 50 share, Max means that he'll have 50% of all American households participating in the Nielsen program of audience measurement watching at that moment. Nielsen Media Research began operations in the 1920s, and by the 1970s, Nielsen households had storage instantaneous odometers which could send information on what was viewed on TV overnight. This whole system was a way of quantifying audience reaction to television broadcasts, as well as an easy way to generate endless anxiety in the heads of people who broadcast. Today, on this medium, YouTube analytics accomplish the same tasks. All I want out of life is a 30 share and a 20 rating. Most of the film network, as most of the existence of actual television networks, is spent chasing these elusive quantifiable engagement metrics, trying to read the minds of the audience and give them what they want. The whole front page of the Daily News is Howard Beale. This is Diana Christensen, played in an Oscar-winning performance by Faye Dunaway, who earns the hell out of it in every scene. I mean, her speeches are spectacular enough. Howard Beale went up there last night and said what every American feels, that he's tired of all the bullshit. He's articulating the popular rage. But the looks she gives are iconic. We're talking about putting a manifestly irresponsible man on national television. That look alone is worth an Oscar. But also, the Diana role is burdened with a lot of the blame for the direction that UBS ends up taking. Sure, today she fits neatly into the trope of what we might call the girlbus, but her role in the film is that of someone who grew up on television. Someone whose ideas represent the future of where the medium is going. We've got a bunch of hobgoblin radicals called the Ecumenical Liberation Army who go around taking home movies of themselves, robbing banks. We'd open each week's segment with that authentic footage, hire a couple of writers to write some story behind that footage, and we've got ourselves a series. A series about a bunch of... Uh... Bank robbing gorillas? What are we gonna call it? The Mousy Tung Hour? <laughs> hey folks, let's televise the revolution. You know, like that song, The Revolution Will and Should Be Televised? You know, that, that song we all know and understand? But the Diana role primarily exists because Chayefsky wanted her to be a foil for the old guard in Max, an old media versus new media Jesus. ugly symbiotic oh, relationship. Boy. And in true old Hollywood fashion, the representative of new media is also a femme fatale. I uh, think I once gave a lecture at the University of Missouri. I was in the audience. I had a terrible schoolgirl crush on you for a couple of months. Oh boy, howdy. What are you doing for dinner tonight? This movie is 47 years old. The film seems to want to put most of the blame for the eventual state of television on the younger generation, represented in Diana as a vulnerability-free ratings-grabbing machine, as if she's any more to blame than Max for enabling Howard's on-air meltdowns. I just ran out of bullshit. All right, cut him off. Leave him on. If this is how he wants to go out, this I is don't how know he goes out. Or network suit Frank Hackett, played by Robert Duvall, who gives this unbelievable speech. The division producing the lowest rate of return has been the news division. I know that historically news divisions are expected to lose money, but to our minds this philosophy is a wanton fiscal affront to be resolutely resisted. Or any of the other old men in suits pushing for a latter-day prophet denouncing the hypocrisy of our times. A latter-day prophet denouncing the hypocrisies of our times. Hey, that sounds pretty good! <laughs> Including Beale himself. And what's wrong with being an angry prophet denouncing the hypocrisies of our times? Do you want to be an angry prophet denouncing the hypocrisies of our times? Yeah, I think I'd like to be an angry prophet denouncing the hypocrisies of our times. But it's Diana who gets called TV incarnate. You're television incarnate, Diana. Indifferent to suffering, insensitive to joy. All of life is reduced to the common rubble of banality. Again, as often as this film gets called prophetic, keep two things in mind. One, it is 47 years old and progress has not stopped in that time period. Some things have aged poorly. I'm thinking of doing a homosexual soap opera. The d 
The heart-rending saga about a woman hopelessly in love with her husband's mistress. You can hear the thought process in 1976. Can you imagine putting a man having a mental breakdown on TV? What's next? The gays? And two, calling the movie prophetic feels guided somehow. After all, the film uses the language, rhetoric, and iconography of a story about a prophet. Last night, I was awakened from a fitful sleep. And the voice said to me, I want you to tell the people the truth. Not an easy thing to do because the people don't want to know the truth. He has a vision from a divine source. Though the movie denies that he's meeting with any one specific god. What is this, the burning bush? For God's sake, I'm not Moses. And the voice said to me, and I'm not God. What has that got to do with it? And I said, why me? And the voice said, because you're on television, dummy. I think when Paddy Chayefsky wrote this, he had a much more subtle idea of a connection to the divine than what's present in most major religions. Then again, most of what I know of Paddy Chayefsky's personal theology comes from his next and last screenplay, Altered States, which is a movie about a man who gets so high he, quite literally, rejects humanity and returns to Munka. <laughs> By all means, watch Ken Russell's Altered States. It is a great time. Chayefsky hated it. He was wrong. The simplest explanation for what happens to Howard Beale is that he has a manic mental breakdown and completely loses touch with reality. I'm imbued, Max. I'm imbued with some special spirit. It's not a religious feeling at all. It's a shocking eruption of great electrical energy. I feel vivid and flashing as if suddenly I've been plugged into some great... Oh, what's that tired old Twitter format joke? Men will literally say they're imbued with some special spirit and a shocking eruption of great electrical energy, vivid and flashing, as if suddenly they've been plugged into some great electromagnetic field connected to all living things, to flowers, birds, all the animals of the world, and even to some great unseen living force, what the Hindus call prana, in a shattering and beautiful sensation, the exalted flow of the space-time continuum, say that it is spaceless and timeless, of such loveliness on the verge of some great ultimate truth, then go to therapy. That's such a mean joke format. We should change it somehow. Here's a detail that always stuck with me. In Max's opening anecdote, he says that he runs late to a story and runs out in a raincoat in his pajamas. And he tells this story to Howard. Take me to the middle of the George Washington Bridge! Ah! He even repeats this pajamas and raincoat story to a laughing office room. Don't do it, buddy. Don't do it. You're young. You get your whole life ahead of you. Right before he finds out that Frank Hackett wants to put Beale back on the air. I just come back from Frank Hackett's office, and he wants to put Howard back on the air tonight. <laughs> and in the lead-up to the central scene of the film, Beale leaves home wearing, of all things, a raincoat over his pajamas, visually tying him to Max's story about apparent suicidal ideation. What do you do, Mr. Beale? I must make my witness. Sure thing, Mr. Beale. It's the outfit that he's wearing during the speech. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not gonna take this anymore! Um... And yes, I realize that I'm wearing the same thing. I'm okay, really. I'm I'm okay. I actually got suspended from Twitter while writing this video, and my mental health has gotten astronomically better. It is so much easier to be a normal person without a calcified record of every bridge you've ever burned, illuminated by the unfiltered id of the masses, raising your blood pressure. Just... An earlier draft of the script asked of this scene, Is this Twitter? And no. There's no way that many people on Twitter would agree on something. All the people posting in hashtag I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore are full of soy. And that's quote tweeted with like a smiling picture of one of those kids from BTS. Or something like that. I haven't been on Twitter for a while. Nothing changes in Howard Beale. And he says, I'm mad as hell, I'm not going to take it anymore. And one of the brilliances of, in the writing of that movie was that Patty would never be sentimental enough 
to make a difference. The thing I think we all need to remember is that mad as hell and not going to take this anymore is reduced to a meaningless catchphrase in the film itself. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it. How do you feel? We're mad as hell and we're not going to take this anymore. With the announcer, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And that that becomes as stupid and duplicitous as anything else. To the point where it overshadows some of the film's far more biting speeches. Like this one. I hate that I can't play the entire unedited speech on YouTube without triggering the copyright bots because it's this speech, not the one that became a catchphrase, that contains the real thesis of the film. Television is not the truth. Television is a goddamn amusement park. We're in the boredom killing business. That thesis being that television, as a medium, cannot capture the full breadth of the human experience. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. Says the Hollywood feature film. More on that later. Turn off your television sets. Turn them off now. Turn them off! And because we're in a film, we can't turn off the sets. It keeps going. Into wild applause. And of course, there's the other big yelling white man scene, where after Howard Beale successfully disrupts the cash flow of his higher ups, his white man yells are out yelled by CCA chairman Arthur Jensen, played by Dan Beatty. You have meddled with the primal forces of nature, Mr. Beale, and I won't have it! Cinema. And you will atone! Am I getting through to you, Mr. Beale? Mm-mm, cinema. Yummy, yummy. Yup, yum, cinema. This one scene wonder is what got Ned Beatty an Oscar nomination. It was the other one scene wonder, Beatrice Strait, as Max's suffering wife Louise Schumacher, who did win. And she earns it. And if you can't work up, I want a passion for me. The least I require is respect and allegiance. And in the process, setting the record for shortest Oscar-winning performance with a mere 5 minutes and 40 seconds of screen time. But that's all I have to say about her. Apologies. Because I have to talk about Beatty's speech which is very ideologically relevant to our discussion. The world is a college of corporations, inexorably determined by the immutable bylaws of business. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. An ideological position can never be really successful until it is naturalized, and it cannot be naturalized while it is still thought of as a value rather than a fact. Accordingly, neoliberalism has sought to eliminate the very category of value in the ethical sense. Over the past 30 years, capitalist realism has successfully installed a business ontology in which it is simply obvious that everything in society, including healthcare and education, should be run as a business. I got this on Amazon. What do you think the Russians talk about in their councils of state? Karl Marx? They get out their linear programming charts, statistical decision theories, min and max solutions, and compute the price, cost, probabilities of their transactions and investments, just like we do. And I will absolutely give it up for how beautifully Chayefsky drops the other shoe. And I have chosen you, Mr. Beale, to preach this evangel. Why me? Because you're on television, dummy. This is not a leftist film, necessarily but it certainly plays well with modern leftist understanding of how capitalism can successfully fold any critique of it back into itself, thus perpetuating capitalism. I have seen the face of God. You just might be right, Mr. Beale. Speaking of screwing over leftists, there's a subplot where Diana produces a show starring a radical communist terror cell called the Ecumenical Liberation Army. The Ecumenical Liberation Army, that's not the one that kidnapped Patty Hearst. No, no, that's the Symbionese Liberation Army. This is the Ecumenical Liberation Army. This analog of Angela Davis and this unfortunate stereotype end up being the hosts of the aforementioned Mao Tse Tung Hour. Though, I don't think anyone here is an actual Maoist. I'm Diana Christensen, a racist lackey of the imperialist ruling circles. I'm Laureen Hobbs, a badass commie Sounds like the basis of a firm friendship. For most of the movie, Diana pretty much keeps them in, as the industry calls it, development hell. 
promising them a time slot and then leaving them to squabble over cash rights. I'm not giving them script approval and I sure as shit ain't cutting them in on my distribution charges. You fascist! Did you see the film we made in the San Marino jail breakout demonstrating the rising up of the seminal prisoner class infrastructure? You can blow the seminal prisoner class infrastructure out your ass! I must regretfully inform you that this is the funniest scene in movie history. Man, give her the f overhead claws. We never get to see any of the footage of the Mao Zedong Hour, which is a shame. The radical leftist's role in the plot ends up being reduced to Chekhov's hired guns. Once Howard Beale's ratings start to dip after he meddles with the primal forces of nature, and he atones by changing his tone, UBS is forced to make a choice that will preserve their ratings. So what do we do about this Beale son of a bitch? I suppose we'll have to kill him. And the film ends as it began. The big screen broken into smaller screens. And the death of our Howard plays alongside an ad for Canada Dry and Life Serial's Mikey commercial. Beale's death, as the film says television does to all things, is reduced to the common rubble of banality. This was the story of Howard Beale, the first known instance of a man who was killed because he had lousy ratings. Now there is already a lot that has been written about Network, and I mean a lot. From the perspective of how great its director Sidney Lumet is, or how great its screenplay by Patty Chayefsky is, or how great its actors are, from Faye Dunaway to William Holden to Ned Beatty to Beatrice Strait to Peter Finch, but if there's anything you should know about me, it's that I'm an anti-autorist. I think auteur theory can only be taken so far before falling back into old, tired, great man theory of history nonsense and other hierarchical forms of thinking. We need alternatives to auteur theory. I made the joke before, all auteurs are bad, and I've heard people misconstrue my attitude about that by saying I think everyone who directs movies is a bad person, and no, not all directors auteurs. It's a question of authority. I just think placing any one person's creative input, director, writer, actor, individual creative workers, that causes people to mindlessly praise and put them on pedestals and you know, continue hierarchies. I'm not here to appeal to the wisdom of daddy. Be that Daddy Lemmett or Daddy Chayefsky or even Daddy Finch. Yes, even daddies that I like. I did a whole video on Umberto Eco and I made some dumbass Mario jokes. I... <laughs> Too much of film criticism seems to focus on whether or not Daddy did a good job or a bad job with the movie making. I'm not much interested in the skill or even the intent of the artists. I am far more interested in exploring the greater culture in which the artists work. The culture with which the artists are in conversation. So for Network, a big screen work that begins and ends by breaking the world up into little screens, that conversation is being held with the smaller screens. So, let's talk TV. New costume. Want to get myself TV ready. I learned to stay hydrated so I don't sweat as much. I'm learning. The medium of television has long fought accusations of appealing to the lowest common denominator of the greater population, with nicknames ranging from the idiot box to boob tube. Boob tube dates back to 1959. Boob, in this case, meaning a foolish person, and tube referring to the technology of cathode ray tubes to contain a vacuum and electron guns which sprayed electrons on a phosphorescent screen to create moving images. And that's why television got the name the tube, and also why tube is in the name of this very platform. And even if we remove the derogatory tone of those old accusations, television was definitely a social force that affected everyone. It was a great cultural homogenizer. You do whatever the tube tells you. You dress like the tube, you ate like the tube, you raise your children like the tube, you even think like the tube. As he says, the tube was a cultural homogenizer. Here's Peter Finch, in his natural English by Australian accent, describing his role. The character that I play, for instance, is, uh, is uh, an anchorman who, to English audience, I don't think we use the word anchorman, is a newsman, like in America, Walter Cronkite or John Chancellor, who in America here are enormously big pundits. They are treated almost as 
philosophers and certain, certainly captains of opinion. And Ed Murrow was a very famous one. Edward Roscoe Murrow is considered a titan in American media. He covered the lead up to the Second World War and the war itself from the ground. This is Trafalgar Square. The noise that you hear at the moment is the sound of the air raid siren. And when he moved to the young medium of television, his reporting proved groundbreaking. His coverage of Senator Joseph McCarthy's anti-communist purges is often cited as the reason McCarthyism remains a dirty word in politics. Or at least it needs to remain so. The actions of the junior senator from Wisconsin have caused alarm and dismay amongst our allies abroad and given considerable comfort to our enemies. And whose fault is that? Not really his. He didn't create this situation of fear, he merely exploited it, and rather successfully. Cassius was right. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Everyone. So having our leads being shown as alumni of the class of Murrow shows how deeply entrenched they are in the system of American television. No, Howard just brought in a picture of Ed Murrow and the whole CBS gang when we were there. Murrow was the first great American anchorman. The anchormen that followed were, true to their monikers, anchors. Cultural grounding forces with the weight and traction to keep public opinion in place. Walter Cronkite, given a stock footage cameo at the beginning of the film, was once considered the most trusted man in America, with the power to end presidencies. This 1968 broadcast is often cited with dissuading Lyndon B. Johnson from seeking re-election. For it seems now more certain than ever that the bloody experience of Vietnam is to end in a stalemate. Of course, that wouldn't be the only memorable broadcast made by Walter Cronkite that year. Nineteen sixty eight would prove to be a key year in the history of American television punditry. During the 1968 presidential election, ABC covered the Republican National Convention in Miami Beach and the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Along with their coverage would be a highly consequential debate about the vocal protests outside the conventions. The moderator would be Howard K. Smith, one of the stock footage cameos at the beginning of this film. The two debaters would be on the conservative side, political pundit, and that one impression that the genie in Aladdin did that you didn't recognize, oh, a, a, a couple of quid pro quo. William F. Buckley. If I may say so, Mr. Smith, it's extremely interesting uh, uh, and extremely lively to sit by and watch a professional uh, critics of the Republican Party uh, burlesque. Uh, people whom uh, the Republicans themselves tend to like. If you play this sort of a game, you can say, look, I don't think it's right to present Mr. Gore Vidal as a political commentator of any consequence, since he is nothing more than, uh, than a literary producer of, uh, of, of a perverted Hollywood-minded prose. And on the liberal side, novelist, political pundit, and all-around bisexual icon, Gore Vidal. Well, as usual, Mr. Buckley, uh, with his enormous and thrilling charm, uh, manages to get away from the issue toward the comedy. He's always to the right, I think, and almost always in the wrong. And you certainly must, uh, Bill, maintain your reputation as being the Marie Antoinette to the right wing, continually imposing your own rather bloodthirsty neuroses on, on a political campaign. It was a gamble. A wildly broadcast debate between two partisans who viscerally despised each other, both possessing a vocabulary broad enough to elaborate why. Who would ever want to see that? We would like now to demonstrate how the English language ought to be used by two craftsmen, our guest commentators. Just as I, I think ABC I think has the right. Idea, Bill, just as I think not... ABC has the authority now, Bill, to invite, I'm almost through. No, you're not. Uh, in every sense. Think, just as, just <laughs> Let Mr. I Buckley think, finish yeah. this sentence. In the last of these debates, Smith made a very stupid analogy. Mr. Vidal, wasn't it a provocative act to try to raise the Viet Cong flag in the park in the film we just saw? Uh, wouldn't that invite uh, raising a Nazi flag in World War II would have had similar consequences. And with the word Nazi now in play, anyone who's ever argued on the internet can guess where it went from there. The right only sort of pro or crypto Nazi yeah. I can think of is yourself. Failing that, 
That's, I would that's, only that's say that we names. can't have now listen, you the right of assembly. Stop calling here. me a crypto Nazi. Let's, let's stop or calling I'll names. I'll you in your get... goddamn face and let's... you'll stay plastered. Now listen, you queer, stop calling me a crypto Nazi or I'll suck you in the goddamn face and you'll stay plastered. Um, word of advice, if someone accuses you of fascism, the best way to defuse that accusation is not to call the accuser queer as an insult while threatening violence. It makes them seem right about you. The 2015 documentary Best of Enemies tells the story of these debates, and there is nothing I can do to improve on that film's depiction of this event. The network nearly shat. And shat they did. And they did shat? And shit they did. And they had shatted. They had been shatting. They shatted and It was a hit. ABC's ratings doubled from their coverage of the previous election of 1964. They got the boost they wanted. And the other networks, naturally, took the wrong lesson from it. Here's Point Counterpoint. CBS's 60 Minutes took the basic premise and made Point Counterpoint a staple of the show. Partisan politics as live theater became a regular network event. So it is in this television environment that the film Network emerged, when the center of American politics seems to have eroded and the epoch of partisan hackery was still in its infancy. And looking at this film today, it feels easy to see Beale as a precursor of all the media figures that I'll mention in the next part of the video, but that's if we see him as a pundit. What if we see him as a prophet. The movie fluctuates back and forth on how much he is tied to traditional religion. Like in this scene, where Diana considers hiring a man to replace Beale. We wanted hellfire, we get Billy Graham, we don't want faith healers, ten show evangelists, our Ober Amagal passion player. So, okay, what does make Howard Beale different from Billy Graham? American preachers have been using the radio since the 1920s, and by 1976 they were certainly no strangers to television. Pat Robertson founded the Christian Broadcasting Network in 1960, and its flagship show, The 700 Club, began in 1966, and is still going. So, Beale wouldn't be out of place in a world of mainstream televangelists. What about that terrific new messiah that ABC was supposed to have signed up as our competition for next year? No. That's him. So, if we see Beale as a secular partisan pundit, sure, he's a frightening new force. But, if we see him as a kind of religious figure, the way this film loosely frames him, his work is fairly traditional. That is, he can, and is, put into the greater context of a specific tradition. We want a prophet, not a curmudgeon. He should do more apocalyptic doom. I think you should take on a couple of writers to write some Jeremiads for him. Oh, hey, that's a fun word. So, what then is a Jeremiad? A Jeremiad is a work of prose or public speech that cries out in mourning for the downfall of a society that has fallen away from a righteous moral path. In other words, exactly what Howard Beale has been saying for the whole movie. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. The Jeremiad is named for, of course, the prophet Jeremiah, who foresaw the destruction of the kingdom of Judah and the first temple and then spent several more books of the Bible going, what did I Say. Key to the preachings of Jeremiah was that the original covenant with God has been broken, thus requiring a new covenant. Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 31 through 33. Behold, those days are coming, declares the Lord, where I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In Judaism, this new covenant, written on hearts and not stone, will be the beginnings of the diaspora, the beginnings of the practice of Judaism as a religion in exile. Christianity, this new covenant will be seen as a prophecy of the coming of Jesus and the start of a new covenant or testament. And in American Christianity, the Jeremiah would have a very, very special place. 
New World, New Covenant. After all, the United States of America was partially founded by religious fanatics who would rather move to a whole new continent and colonize everyone who lived there instead of live next to people who spoke Dutch. Ever since John Winthrop borrowed a phrase from the Gospel of Matthew and said that this new colony should be as a city on a hill, the notion of American exceptionalism also produced a particularly American form of Jeremiah, one where this quote-unquote new world would also bring a chance for a new covenant with God. Take the 18th century American preacher Jonathan Edwards, who warned that because the common people have ignored the covenant, all that kept them from eternal damnation was the will of a capricious God. In the central metaphor of his 1741 sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. So that thus it is, that natural men are held in the hand of God over the pit of hell. They have deserved the fiery pit and are already sentenced to it. And God is dreadfully provoked. His anger is as great towards them as to those that are actually suffering the executions of the fierceness of his wrath in hell. And they have done nothing in the least to appease or abate that anger. Neither is God in the least bound by any promise to hold him up one moment. The devil is waiting for them. Hell is gaping for them. The flames gather and flash about them and would fain lay hold on them and swallow them up. The fire pent up in their own hearts is struggling to break out, and they have no interest in any mediator. There are no means within reach that can be any security to them. Wow, more like congregation in the hands of a run-on sentence. In short, they have no refuge, nothing to take hold of. All that preserves them every moment is the mere arbitrary will and uncovenanted, unobliged forbearance of an incensed god. This is considered a classic of early American literature. In The American Jeremiad by Sackman Berkovich, he wrote, The ritual of the Jeremiad bespeaks an ideological consensus in moral, religious, economic, social, and intellectual matters unmatched in any other modern culture. And the power of consensus is nowhere more evident than the symbolic meaning of the Jeremiads infused into the term America. Only in the United States has nationalism carried with it the Christian meaning of the sacred. Only America, of all national designations, has assumed the combined force of eschatology and chauvinism. It's hard to talk about American exceptionalism without sounding like an American exceptionalist yourself, huh? Central to the ideology of American exceptionalism is this idea that America isn't just a nation state, but a calling an errand on earth, a divine mission from God to make America the best country in the history of countries or something. That thought can be followed through its use in the rhetoric of Emerson, Melville, and Whitman, and through the language of activism in the works of Frederick Douglass and W.E.B. Du Bois. And even 21st century neoliberals like Barack Obama use the Jeremiad. On both sides of the proverbial aisle, the rhetoric of the Jeremiad remains the same. We in America began with grand ideals that we have not fulfilled, but by God, often literally, we may save ourselves from ruination. USA, USA, USA. It almost sounds like palingenetic ultranationalism, dare I say. Huh. That wasn't in the script. Should I put it in the final edit? I don't know, future Kyle. In this way, Howard Beale wouldn't be seen as someone innovating the medium of television, but as bringing back a much older pre-television rhetoric. Just another preacher on a pulpit. Or he might be. One problem with Network is that it's very top-heavy. A lot is heard from Network heads about what Beale could do for them, and very little from Beale about his actual role. Partially because his own rhetoric gets a little hard to follow. and partially because his calls for direct action are memorable, but rare. We see three instances of Beale calling for direct action. The first call is to just have people shout the phrase. I'm mad as hell! I'm not gonna take it anymore! I'm mad as hell! The second call to action is to return to more traditional forms of self-fulfillment. If you want the truth, go to God. Go to your gurus. And that could be seen as a bit religious, 
But more importantly, the call to action is to stop treating TV as the only authoritative source in their lives and turn the television off. Turn them off and leave them off! Turn them off right in the middle of a sentence I'm speaking! And the third call to action, and the most direct, specific action called for by Beale, is to stop the acquisition of CCA, which owns UBS, by the Western World Funding Corporation. Well, just who in the hell is the Western World Funding Corporation? It is a consortium of banks and insurance companies who are not buying CCA for themselves, but as agents for somebody else. And who is the somebody else? They won't tell you. They won't tell you. They won't tell the Senate. They won't tell the SEC, oh. the FTC. They won't tell... Now, I hope my audience is smart enough to have their ears prick up when they hear the rhetoric of a group of mysterious bankers who owe their relations to no one who are taking over our institutions. I will tell you who they're buying CCA for. They're buying it for the Saudi Arabian Investment Corporation. They are buying it for the Arabs! And I also hope that my audience is as relieved as I was to reveal that the mysterious bankers were Saudi Arabian. Now, in the mid-1970s, America was still stinging after the Saudi government led a worldwide oil embargo against every nation that supported Israel during the Yom Kippur War. In fact, throughout the film, news headlines repeatedly mention how oil prices keep rising. The Arabs have decided to jack up the price of oil another 20%. Oil ministers of the OPEC nations meeting in Vienna still haven't decided how much more to increase the price of oil. This has been the yeah, most divisive meeting the oil states have Super. ever had. The 13 nations of OPEC have still not been able to decide by how much to increase okay. the price of oil. Then we'll figure out what to do about the depression and the inflation and the oil crisis. So having the Saudis as a televised antagonist for an American TV show makes plenty of xenophobic sense. The Arabs control 16 billion dollars in this country. Now in the story, this is Howard Beale's tipping point. This is when, in the eyes of people controlling him, he goes too far. This is when he starts biting the hand that feeds. The Arabs are simply buying us! And it's this outburst where he stops the buyout of CCA that gets him dressed down by Arthur Jensen. This is how he meddled with the primal forces of nature, and why he must atone. You think you merely stopped a business deal? That is not the case. The Arabs have taken billions of dollars out of this country, and now they must put it back! Rewatching this movie, what struck me the most about this sequence is how naively Beale stumbled upon discovering the true source of power in the world. He fights against the consolidation of capital, but for him, the terrifying thing about it is that it's not just the consolidation of capital, but that it's Arab capital. Foreign capital. That's a common problem with a lot of Hollywood critiques of capitalism. They often fall into lazy xenophobia. Instead of focusing on showing the ill effects of a system where anyone can be bought and sold, they play on fears of what would happen if some foreigners bought us. You are an old man who thinks in terms of nations and peoples. There are no nations. There are no peoples. The issue with capitalism is how much power it gives those with capital. The issue is not that those with capital are the wrong kind of people. For more on this idea, take a second to Google the phrase, the socialism of fools. There is only one holistic system of systems. One vast and imane, interwoven, interacting, multivariate, multinational dominion of dollars. I'm sure this is what right-wing conspiracy theory types think when they use the word globalist. For them, the problem is not that the multinational dominion of dollars is capitalist, but that it is multinational that is globalist, that is anti-nationalist. And I think in this reading, Howard Beale might just be another old-style nationalist. I got up here and asked you people to stand up and fight for your heritage, and you did, and it was beautiful. To people, one, it was a radiant eruption of democracy. But I think that was it, fellas. Howard Beale, American exceptionalist, reworking the American Jeremiah. I don't mean that the United States is finished as a world power. The United States is the richest, the most powerful, the most advanced country in the world, light years ahead of any other country. And I don't mean the communists are going to take over the world because the communists are deader than we are. Now here I sit, born right before the end of the Cold War, not having been brought up being told necessarily that socialism is simply everything that America isn't. 
I am a full bleeding heart pinko PC SJW soy boy woke cuck. What is finished is the idea that this great country is dedicated to the freedom and flourishing of every individual in it. It's the individual that's finished. And I can't help but wonder if Beale is getting so close to that moment of clarity he so desperately needs. It's a nation of some 200 odd million transistorized, deodorized, whiter than white, steel belted bodies, totally unnecessary as human beings, and as replaceable as piston rods. Like, damn, Howard, that sucks. I mean, you're saying the current system is turning people into objects? Like, their worth is in how much value can be extracted from their labor and not something inherent to themselves? I mean, damn, Howard, that, that sucks. Um, I wonder, has any philosopher ever written about that before? Like, has there ever been a school of thought that describes this system in a, a, a plain materialist way and suggests ways to transcend this system that alienates individuals from the value of their labor? Um, actually, it, didn't UBS hire some, you know, pretty well-read people to lead into you? Uh, maybe they can turn you on to some literature that might help you. Oh. Right. The, the leftists in this movie are only here to shoot guns. The black leftists are only in this movie to argue with each other and shoot guns. This movie is 47 years old. I should add that this film was not universally beloved on its release. Pauline Kael noted how odd it was that so much of the absurdism came from the subplot of hiring black leftist radicals for network TV, as if that was the true problem in the medium of television. Kale also called it a messianic farce, with its various actors taking turns to yell at us soulless masses. Nevertheless, this hagiography of the fictional prophet Howard Beale captured the popular imagination. But despite his solid record of achievement, it was his performance in Network that belatedly brought him to the full attention of Hollywood. And it's particularly sad that he should have died just when the rewards that attend a successful actor were beginning to come his way. Peter Finch died of a sudden heart attack at the age of 60 in January of 1977, and he made history by becoming the first actor to win an Academy Award for performing posthumously. The second one being, of course, Heath Ledger. Coincidentally, both actors had their performances mythologized and turned into a meme. Just like how every bad faith online actor probably recites the all part of the plan monologue, so everyone started their own private Howard Beale impression. It makes me wonder how different pop culture might be if either actor lived to get their awards. Maybe Heath Ledger would have gone on talk shows and said, y you realize that the Joker should not be idolized, right? His view of the world is wrong, and it's proven wrong in the movie itself. People show that, given the choice, they can be kind and selfless. The Joker is wrong. By the same token, I can imagine Peter Finch snuffing out the popular conception of Howard Beale on talk shows. And so he's going to get fired. It doesn't matter how famous, how marvelous, how wonderful you are. If the ratings start to fall and the network so decides, you will go. And this is a dreadful blow to a man of some 50 summers. And at the same time, he's recently lost his wife. He's drinking too much. I can imagine him saying, well, Beale was just very sad and desperate. His depression was exploited by his friends and colleagues and turned into a spectacle that he himself tries to fight against. And it's a fight that he loses. But that's me speculating. The reality is that Finch did not live to see Howard Beale's afterlife in popular culture. And what an afterlife. You can watch poorly performed knockoff versions of Howard Beale's mad as hell speech every night nowadays on any number of cable networks. Except I believed Howard Beale's emotion when he gave that speech. I don't believe those who now attempt to stir anger and outrage every night. Because it is popular, it becomes shtick. Which is what happened to Beale's outrage as well. So I want everybody who can hear my voice right now to get up, go over to their windows, and I want you to yell, I'm fed up, Arnold, and I don't care who knows it. I'm not a hell, I'm not gonna take it anymore! Standing up.
up as free Americans and exercising our right to say we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. I'm going to run to a window and say, hey, these floors are dirty as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Come on, friends, run to your window and shout, I'm really cheesed and I'm not going to hang around till this thing gets better. I'm as mad as all get out and I'm not going to take it anymore. We're pissed up and we're not going to take it anymore. Anybody remember what we're pissed off about? I want you to get up and grab your computer, enable voice to text, and I want you to yell. I want you to yell, I'm mad, mad. I want you to yell, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take Sam anymore. And you will atone. It's Ned Beatty from Network. For Christ's sakes, guys. Uh, no, that is not a comprehensive montage of every pop culture reference ever made to Network. That would be very difficult to pull off. And also it would have to include Spike Lee's Bamboozled, which is one, a bummer, and two, far too complex a film to be irresponsibly taken out of context. But I do recommend watching it, if you can stomach a brutal and violent satire of the history of black representation in American media. Anyway, back on topic. Network noticed a trend in television news, a trend it did not start, but rather dramatized. And that trend in television news was toward spectacle. Now, spectacle and news, that's hard for me to track. That's hard for anyone to track. I'll admit this is a huge subject I'm attempting to tackle. Massive, even. Massive as mass media itself. The gradual mutation of TV news slowly, irrevocably continued, becoming more outrageous and more entertainment focused. Everybody's mad as hell, but they're not sure what at. Point counterpoint kept going strong and became the stuff of parody. Jane, you ignorant slut. This was a popular catchphrase. You are allowed to cringe. The big three networks exploded into dozens with the advent of cable. Ted Turner launched the Cable News Network in 1980, starting the 24-hour news cycle. One early hit was Crossfire, hosted by Pat Buchanan and Tom Braden, launching in 1982. It is my humble duty tonight to introduce you to the grand and imperial wizard of the invisible knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Oof. Issue 2, Elephant Hunt. The McLaughlin Group also began in 1982, making its way through public broadcast stations across the country, making heated roundtable discussions of politics a regular spectacle. Bonds. Bumper stays. Novak. It's ridiculously safe. Jamond. Yeah, exactly. Kondracki. Safe. Who said that the seat was anything but safe? You must you it would also become the stuff of parody. Issue number five, what number am I thinking of? Pat Buchanan. <laughs> Jeez, uh, 82. Wrong, uh, Eleanor Clift. Uh, is it between one Don't and a hundred? Don't the issue. And I, in this time, the news became more cinematic. It's hard to imagine a more cinematic sound than John Williams, who wrote the NBC Nightly News theme in 1985. NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. But the true effects of journalistic spectacle were subtle. In 1987, James L. Brooks directed a film that contained a far more insightful and subtle critique of how cinematic spectacle damaged journalistic ethics than anything in network. In broadcast news, an anchor, played by William Hurt, airs a story he shot where he interviews a victim of S.A., a story that ends up making his career. I'm sorry. I promised myself I wasn't going to cry. Can you spot what's wrong with this scene? You know how Tom had tears in his eyes? Ask yourself how we were able to see that when he only had one camera and it was pointed at the girl during the entire interview. Oh, it kills me we didn't get you on camera. So powerful seeing your reaction. Really? For a second there, I thought you were going to cry yourself. In filmmaking, acting out a scene twice and shooting it from another angle to capture another person's reaction is just standard procedure. To do an interview twice just to capture the journalist acting out his tears? That's just plain fiction as fact. Thank you very much for your attendance at such uh, short notice. The true watershed year for American news media would be 1996. In that year, two new cable channels would be launched. The first was the Microsoft National Broadcasting Company, 
made with the original Big Three network NBC, and Microsoft. The second was launched by Rupert Murdoch, who, in the 80s, had used his news corporation to buy up the shell of DeMont and a dozen other local stations to create the Fox Broadcasting Company, the first truly successful fourth network. Murdoch used its success to launch another channel in the News Corporation empire. How delighted I am that we've now reached this moment when we can firmly announce uh, the starting of a Fox News channel. Both of these networks would successfully rival CNN, and in the process mutate the news landscape even further. Especially after the biggest story of the new century broke. There was a you know, fight from inside. Looks like six, seven floors were taken uh, out. There's more explosions right now. Hold on, people are running. Right. With a terrified viewership now playing for any news, 24 hour news cycles became essential viewing. And in this time, Fox News positioned itself as a counterweight to the supposedly left biased other media. Or, as its eternally bullshit slogan declared, they were fair and balanced. The 2004 MoveOn.org distributed Robert Greenwald directed documentary Outfoxed, Rupert Murdoch's War on Journalism, blew that myth away with the classic cinematic language of montage. Some people say. Some people say that you may be setting up Sharpton for a run against Hillary. The idea behind journalism is that you're sourcing who you're referring to. This is just sort of a clever way of, of inserting political opinion. Some people say. Some people say. Some people say it's just too violent, there's too much blood. Some people say. Some people say. Robert Greenwald's documentaries are generally okay, but I'm mainly bringing up out Fox because of this one interview late in the film. It's ironic. Da, 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 30 years da, da, since Patty Chayefsky wrote da, da, Network. Da, 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 but I really believe da, 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 those pathetic words that were spoken by da, da, Peter Finch when he finally got out of the chair and said, it's time. Go to the window, shake your fist, and say, I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. I think those are resonant words. But that analogy doesn't work. I mean, let's really ask ourselves. In this analogy, wouldn't Howard Beale be on Fox News? Now everybody do the propaganda. By 2004, a new Big Three networks had formed. Three 24-hour news cycles with competing ideologies and competing viewerships. Fox News had become the network to beat. Bill O'Reilly dominated cable ratings, as he loved to remind his audience, with MSNBC's Countdown with Keith Olbermann set up as a direct rival. It was a cross-channel game of escalation. CNN's crossfire kept going strong into the 21st century, with its rotating hosts eventually landing on Paul Begala and Tucker Carlson until a memorable encounter with a man who made it his mission to mock the 24-hour news cycle. Here, here's just one, what I wanted to tell you guys. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> this, you're doing theater when you should be doing debate, which would be great. You do no, it's, it's, it's not, not honest. What you do is not honest. Course, what you do is partisan honest. hackery. Crossfire was canceled a year after this. I do think you're more fun on your show, uh, just my opinion. But can't, okay, can't, just that, John Stewart goes, you know what's one interesting one though? Fans you're as big a dick on your show <laughs> as you are on any show. And Tucker Carlson was never heard from again. This is The Daily Show with John Stewart. John Stewart's The Daily Show became a hit because it found comedy material in the news of spectacle launching reaction after reaction to performatively passionate punctry. Fox News had made the Jeremiad a nightly ritual, and many commenters before me have made the connection between Howard Beale and Fox News, even non-American ones. Now, I don't know if you've seen the superb and prophetic movie Network in which Peter Finch played a news anchor who loses his mind and becomes a ranting, raving, rating smash after sinister bosses leave him on air. This is basically like that, but crazier, and starring Paul Giamatti in a blonde wig. And it seems like the voices of our leaders and special interests and the media, they're surrounding us. It is, it sounds intimidating. Or mental. Charlie Brooker would also do a sort of retelling of Network with his Black Mirror episode 15 Million Merits, where Daniel Kaluuya plays out a reality show version of 1984, ending with a savage, desperate howl of rage. F you for happening! F you for me! For us! For everyone! F you! And he, like Howard Beale, 
has his genuine burst of emotion folded back into the system and made into a hollow performance. Farewell forever. Till the same time next week. But if I'm going to talk about the legacy of Network, I have to talk about the man who all but declared himself to be the legacy of Network. It's impossible to describe what it feels like to be handed the same award that was given to Patty Chayefsky 35 years ago for another movie with Network in the title. The first time I saw Network was a 2 p.m. screening when I was 15. The second time I saw it was the 5 p.m. screening. Probably didn't even understand what I'd just seen, but I was thrilled by it. What hit me hardest was the power of Chayefsky's language. His dialogue in Network is like a fleet of Apache attack helicopters appearing over the horizon, coming right at you. I'm Aaron Sorkin, the West Wing, few good men, the social network. Studio 60. Shut up. We're all being lobotomized by this country's most influential industry. So why don't you just change the channel? Turn off your TV, do it right now, go ahead. Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, which ran for one season, was Aaron Sorkin's Network AU fanfic. And in his teleplay, he admits it. He was Live mad broadcast. as hell, and he wasn't going to take it anymore. Peter Finch's Oscar winning performance in the 1977 film Network. Studio 60 got off to a start that would have made Patty Chayefsky smile. You believe this? I say they've heard of Patty Chayefsky, that's a step in the right direction. Aaron Sorkin's whole career is arguably a reference to Network. The premier liberal respectability politician made his name designing the immaculate talk of the most brilliant people in the room who end up shaping the perfect mass message. Yes, even the show best known as a liberal fantasy about what's presentable as presidential is all about what the masses will think. Why do you suppose this one's so hard to spin? Because it's the classic Washington scandal. We screwed up by telling the truth. All right. Let's try not to do that that much. And the story which won him an Oscar is, like Network, about a man's emotionally driven destructive experimentations with a new medium and the radical social consequences of those experiments. But The Social Network, as a legal drama about social media, was always a Web 2.0 story by a Web 1.0 writer. His writing often feels like he's trying to recreate the world that existed at the start of Network, going back to the people who made television, yet weren't raised on it. I guess the most prophetic thing about the film is that many news organizations have stopped making journalistic decisions and have gone all in on commercial decisions. Sorkin is great about dramatizing the people who shape media, but he never had a grasp of the new media that followed. Sit down, we're gonna post a response on the site. No. Yeah, we gotta post a response to someone. It's a bad idea. Why? You don't know these people. Neither do you. Oh, yes, I do. What's wrong with them? Nobody knows. Aaron Sorkin always felt like he underestimated the internet? To be a very unusual social structure. For instance, there's a leader who seems to pride herself on her organizational skills and a certain amount of discipline. He does seem to do an awful lot of scolding. You post it in the wrong place, stay on topic people, don't use capital letters. Josh Lyman is picking a fight with the moderator. He's, he's supposed to be the smart guy in the series. And I believe I'll use capital, lowercase, or Sanskrit right up until the moment the font police cuffed me and read me Miranda. That'll show him. Uh, it's, all right, it's a funny scene. The internet people are going crazy. You're kidding. Meanwhile on the internet, getting mad as hell was just baseline behavior unencumbered by an older class of standards and practices, and on some sites even without moderators, it allowed a new generation of pundits to find audiences outside of the television system. Cenk Uyghur's The Young Turks were initially unable to get a foot in the door of the old networks. So he took his group away from that tube of theirs and onto this tube of yours. So why did we pick The Young Turks name? Because it meant young progressives looking to overthrow the established system. They also committed the Armenian Genocide, which is probably why they prefer TYT now. Cenk Uyghur would eventually turn his YouTube success into mainstream recognition, partially helping to turn the very platform upon which you are watching this video into the media behemoth it is now. And for better or worse, Uyghur understood what television had become and why it worked. In real life, what I would do is say, all right, now shut up and I'm going to tell you what it's about. They don't do that on television, and that's why television is boring, okay? And Bill O'Reilly does do it, and you might think he's a dick, but he's also number one on television. We're just worried because we're slight 
right? I need to point out that these clips are from a documentary about Jenk Uyghur called, fittingly, Mad as Hell. I don't think it's that big a deal to lose your temper over that. The major networks continued on their path while the online media landscape took shape and played catch up, interweaving and shaping each other into the endless howl that is the Anglophone media landscape. Lied so often and so persistently that the boy cried wolf and they didn't the trust one. the media anymore. Everything that has that was discussed about television and that movie has happened. Everyone in every part of this media landscape wound up taking all the wrong lessons from the film. And here we are on Satan's own internet, having learned nothing. Very much I'll tell you later. what, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Of course you are, you very proud boy. That man named a white supremacist vigilante group after a Broadway song. I will try to try hard to make you proud of your boy. I'm going to form my own Antifa counter-terror group. Uh, we're calling ourselves the 76 Trombones. The more we'll we from. accomplish, the more you f inconsequential f Trivialize our accomplishments! It would be a Herculean task for me to map out the entirety of the complex media landscape that exists now, with its endless crashing waves of reaction and response and counter-response and commentary, where everyone and anyone with an internet connection can yell how they're mad as hell as long and as loudly as they want without any guidance. And it's happening from the old boob tube to the new YouTube. So it feels like Howard Beale is everywhere. Everywhere someone is angry, it feels like an echo of his own rage. What, for Lumbett and Chayefsky, was the death rattle of a sober medium, became the very air that we breathed. That's the eternal problem with satire. Terrible ideas mocked are still terrible ideas entertained. Or, as we put it on the internet, JK, LOL. Unless... And so yesterday's modest proposal becomes tomorrow's menu. You're literally you do on your to, ass you to for a living! Response. Get up! We do have to... Go ahead, Steven. Clips of people getting mad as hell still go viral all the time. Go viral. There's a phrase that wouldn't make much sense in 1976 when you're talking about media. I mean, Network was simply a film about television. And this is an internet video talking about that film, talking about its influence on television and the internet. Media about media influencing media. So let's get to the center of it and talk about media itself. Digital humanities scholar Kathleen Fitzpatrick in her paper, Network, the Other Cold War, argued that network might be best understood as a tension between two mediums, film and television, mediums that had been in competition for decades, and still are. Network can be usefully read as a document of the anxiety of obsolescence, and thus the sight of one skirmish in the cultural conflict that one might think of as the Other Cold War. Network reveals the detente between film and television, the superpowers of the entertainment industry, during this late moment in the Cold War era. On the one hand, during the late 1970s, television was experiencing its own anxiety as its cultural dominance began to show signs of weakness. On the other hand, one must remember that even during this Hollywood renaissance of the 1970s, which Pauline Kael has referred to as the one true golden age, what the film industry was fighting for was a place within a complex of media and popular entertainment industries that was dominated more completely than ever before or since by the television broadcast networks. In other words, the makers of media were fighting for attention from a massive viewing public. True then, true now. And new media, wherever it comes from, upsets the old media as it enters that fight. And because no one can talk about 20th century media without quoting Marshall McLuhan, any new medium, by its acceleration, disrupts the lives and investments of whole communities. 
In that same book, Understanding Media, McLuhan also wrote that, All meaning alters with acceleration because all patterns of personal and political interdependence change with any acceleration of information. Some feel keenly that speed up has impoverished the world they knew by changing its forms of human interassociation. There is nothing new or strange in a parochial preference for those pseudo-events that happen to enter into the composition of society just before the electric revolution of this century. The student of media soon comes to expect the new media of any period whatever to be classed as pseudo by those who have acquired the patterns of earlier media, whatever they may happen to be. Old and new media have always had a toxic relationship. Come to think of it, it's a toxic relationship dramatized in the film itself, played out as an old man and his affair with his young female co-worker. The anxiety of competing mediums is turned into a patriarchal melodrama, where all the old media can do is shout and enable and make things worse, and yet somehow, the new media always gets the blame. Your television incarnate, Diana. Diana Christensen did nothing wrong, except for calling for murder. It's common knowledge that new forms are distrusted by old forms. For good reason. Every time a new medium, a new information distributing technology is created, massive cultural upheavals follow. In Mesopotamia, in China, and Mesoamerica, writing is created. And with it, a new literate class which could administrate and give laws, leaving the illiterate classes as mere barbarians. Sculpture and representational arts are used to mimic nature, and religions start to revolve around the proper use of these icons, some even prohibiting them. The printing press is invented. Someone uses it to translate certain sacred texts, and suddenly people are more interested in hearing what their neighbors have to say more than the old priest class. Photography is invented and refined over a century, and old powers suddenly find it harder to control official narratives. Take, for example, the Congo Free State, where atrocities committed under the watch of Belgian King Leopold II led to a global investigation and denouncement of his rule. Leopold fought back with a propaganda war, one that he lost against published testimonies and photographic evidence. In 1905, Mark Twain wrote a satirical pamphlet, Leopold's Soliloquy, imagining the king raging against his enemies, the greatest of which was the Kodak. The Kodak has been a sore calamity to us, the most powerful enemy that has confronted us indeed. In the early years, we had no trouble in getting the press to expose the tales of the mutilations as slanders, lies, inventions of the busybody American missionaries and exasperated foreigners who found the open door of the Berlin Congo Charter closed against them when they innocently went out there to trade. And by the press's help, we got the Christian nations everywhere to turn an irritated and unbelieving ear to those tales and say hard things about the tellers of them. Yes, all things went harmoniously and pleasantly in those good days, and I was looked up to as the benefactor of a downtrodden and friendless people. Then all of a sudden came the crash. That is to say, the incorruptible Kodak. And all the harmony went to hell. The only witness I have encountered in my long experience that I couldn't bribe. Every Yankee missionary and every interrupted trader sent home and got one, and now, oh well, the pictures get sneaked around everywhere, in spite of all we can do to ferret them out and suppress them. The 10,000 pulpits and 10,000 presses are saying the good word for me all the time, and placidly and convincingly denying the mutilations, then that trivial little Kodak that a child can carry in its pocket gets up, uttering never a word, and knocks them dumb. The power of photography in the Congo was proof that a new form of media could document the abuses of power in a way that directly challenged it. For a time. That was 1905, remember. Over a century since, there have been many crimes against humanity committed by many nation-states against many peoples, with mountains of photographic evidence documenting them. And yet, for all of these crimes, there are still... deniers. Of all the Viet Cong terrorist attacks in Saigon in the last three years, this was the boldest. Television, too, served as a disruptive medium. 
America was losing badly in its war in Vietnam, and Americans knew it because of the simple fact that American journalists were able to show it on television. TV in the 60s turned the American public against the Vietnam War, and in the 70s, the president who inherited and escalated that war resigned, rather than face a lengthy and possibly televised impeachment hearing. What about television? I believe the trial of Richard Nixon, if it ever comes to pass, would have to be televised live from start to finish, or at least put on tape simply for the historic record. The people would have to have some opportunity to see for themselves if the trial were fair. Thus, we have the older, slower medium of the feature film expressing its anxiety over the disruptive potential of the newer, faster medium of the live television broadcast. This tube can make or break presidents, popes, Prime Ministers, this tube is the most awesome goddamn force in the whole godless world. And woe is us if it ever falls into the hands of the wrong people. But even over time, as the film predicted, television would be a suppressive force. America certainly fought in many wars since Vietnam, but none would be as thoroughly televised as Vietnam was. Nixon's media strategist would go on to serve under Reagan and then go into television himself and founded a 24-hour news network that would ensure no Republican president would lose office for impeachable offenses ever again. Since Fox News was founded in 1996, there have been 10-ish separate American-involved wars and three impeachments. And little in American society has fundamentally changed. And then, of course, there's the new news. The Internet a state of constant upheaval and pushback, an endless, silent howl. The internet is a terrible place. Actually, no, the world is a terrible place. The internet is just a document of it. Actually, no, not even that. The world is as terrible as it is wondrous, as it is mundane, as it is extraordinary, as cruel as it is kind. And all of those things are on the internet as well. It is, as the internet's current poet laureate described it, everything, all of the time, a little bit of everything, all of the time. So if network can be read as a legacy medium, film, wailing in fear of the rising influence of the new medium, television, how can we read film as grandchildren of both media, while operating within another new media with an immediacy, a spontaneity, a ubiquity, and a utility surpassing the dinosaurs of cinema and broadcast. How should the internet generation read network? Here the jokes write themselves. Mainstream media boomer has meltdown over woke media with a thumbnail putting Peter Finch's face next to that crying kid that the most annoying YouTubers can't stop using. I genuinely hope that kid is okay. I hope they're having a very chill time. I hope they have ice cream. But really. There's a question that's haunted me for a long time now. If the inciting incident of network were to occur today, if, in reality, not fiction, a news anchor were to announce their suicide on camera, would anyone care? In the film, we never glean much of what the audience feels about Beale's Jeremiads. We hear plenty from inside the network, Plenty of thoughts from the men in suits whose bank accounts depend on the success of UBS and the Howard Beale Show. It's a big, fat, big, titted hit! It's the number one show in television! But the actual audience for the Howard Beale Show is distant. It's hard to get actual opinions from Nielsen ratings. Sure, they had letters and such. Go down to the mailroom. As of this minute, over 14,000 telegrams. The response is sensational. But we never learn what they say. We don't actually know what the people have to say beyond parroting the catchphrase. How do you feel? We're mad as hell, and we're not going to this anymore! It's not like anyone who made this film could conceive of a comment section. So, regarding those letters, we don't know if that mass reaction contained messages of agreement, or messages of cruelty, encouraging Beale to follow through on his original promise. And we all know that messages like that could exist. We've all read comment sections. We know what some people are like. And we also know, since we all know what comments are like, that there must have been messages of concern, of empathy and kindness, 
of people hoping that Howard is getting the kind of help and support he so clearly needs. Because if one thing is clear about watching Peter Finch's performance as Howard Beale, it's that Howard Beale is suffering and needs help. Or maybe there are people complaining about how he threw his dead wife under the bus by complaining about their marriage on TV. And I was married for 33 years of shrill, shrieking fraud. I'm sorry, but you devote decades of your life to someone and the only words you have to describe her are shrieking and shrill? Excuse me? Are you sexist as hell and expecting all of us to take it evermore? Yes, we are canceling fictional character Howard Beale. Um... By the way, let's roll back the discourse around cancel culture and recognize its roots as a facetious attempt to get new media to act the way old media used to. A television-centric popular culture had shows canceled out of poor ratings or public scandal. And for a medium that was on supply and not demand, that meant an offender canceled was an offender removed from public view. But the internet gives media figures a ubiquity and a permanence unfiltered by a board of standards and practices like one would see on a traditional television network. Not just broadcast once, but broadcast, re-uploaded, reposted, and shared virally. And so once upon a time on the internet, when someone was cancelled, it was something of a joke. Something of a way to reapply the self-correcting principles of older media. There is no network to cancel personality XYZ, and therefore only the audience can cancel personality XYZ. Oh, the horror. <sighs> Finally, a way to understand an audience's wishes in a qualitative way, and not the quantitative rating systems. How we fear the masses, while needing the masses. Even while being a part of the masses. I've learned not to trust anyone who complains about cancel culture from the right or the left. Those who complain about cancel culture often cannot or will not address criticism out of a hyperbolic fear of an imagined median audience whose trust they fear they have forever lost. That's all being canceled is. The realization that you've lost people's trust. And this does tie back into this whole old new media discussion. Who can trust television? And who can trust the internet? There is no most trusted person on the internet. Just a gaggle of wannabe patriarchs and the unknown heroes that re-edit their ramblings to make them say goofy shit. Can anyone remember the entire so-called alphabet? A, B, E, S, G, I, E, K, YouTube poops are praxis. You can quote me on that. If you're Dutch, ask yourself. Why? Although YouTuber discursive spaces have been thoroughly transformed ever since the great Shannon Strucci deconstructed and subsequently mainstreamed the term parasocial relationship, it remains a fundamental fact that the parasocial relationship is the central driving force of the content creator economy. And it always has. Millions of Americans had a parasocial relationship with Walter Cronkite and with Edward Murrow before him. But that center is gone. Demagogues are plentiful, but in the sea of knowledge we are adrift without anchors. And I know I'm saying this with the center framing and camera eye contact of a YouTuber who wants to be taken seriously, but let's be real. I know the game. And I know how poorly I play it. Most of my income comes through Patreon, through people who decide that I'm worth $2 a month because they want to hear more of my voice, see more of my face, and express more of my thoughts. And every month, I need to prove that I am still worth supporting, that I'm still worth the parasocial relationship. And it's a fine line to walk. Because I do not want a parasocial relationship with my audience. I'm terrified of my audience. My audience has been incredibly invasive in the past. My audience has made my relationships their own and ruined them. My audience has hurt people that I cared about. 
because of me. I mean, I've considered that other ways that other YouTubers engage, and they, that terrifies me. For every comment I get worrying about my mental health every time I self-deprecate on camera, I think about how many YouTubers should doubt themselves. You think Andrew Tate would have turned so many kids into rabid sexists if he didn't have the confidence of a cult leader? You think Steven Crowder would be making queer people afraid to go out in public if he just once thought about who he was hurting? Do you think popular leftist white Twitch debater would laugh it off every time he trended on Twitter if he once considered that his combative debate tactics posed a danger to anyone on his stream who wasn't himself? Real talk, I would rather languish in obscurity and anonymity than be anything like those monsters. I would rather be known by no one than have the rabid fan bases curated by those fork-tongued solipsists. Having fans? It's scary. It's so scary I've tried getting rid of them. In the past few years, I've started doing things on this channel that <laughs> deliberately in order to be less likable. I've screamed at the camera. I've broken my own algorithm. Before my Twitter was permanently suspended, which is wonderful, by the way, I have never been happier, thank you. I used to have regular public breakdowns about how terrible of a person I know myself to be. I have canceled myself. Don't be a fan of me. Definitely don't stand me. Don't stand anyone, let alone me. You know the song Stan Ends, right? A fifth of vodka and a murder-suicide. Over Eminem! The things that random fans have done out of supposed protection of or concern for me terrifies me to my core. The thousands out there, the thousands of clicks on these videos, each one is a new pair of eyes to judge and condemn. And fans, do not forget that the word of fan is fanatic. Heaven save me from fans. Heaven save all of us from fans. You thousands of people who consider yourselves fans don't expect us tiny little people on the screen to save you. We are pixels, not people. I have already been filmed doing these actions weeks ago, and by the time this video hits your retinas, I will have already moved on to some other project that will hopefully not burn me out. Oh, if Patty Chayefsky thought TV people were in the boredom killing business, holy Christ on avocado toast. I have known so many internet people, and hear me when I tell you that more than half the time the boredom they are trying to kill is their own. Leftist YouTubers won't save the world. I certainly won't. I majored in theater. We are the thing you put on while you eat and forget about your immediate problems. We can't force change when you're just there Sitting there trying to live your life, we have all put our hopes into the ridiculous belief in a potential pop culture perestroika, when we know the only way popular culture can liberate us is if we are liberated from it. No gods, no masters, no stands, no fandoms. You have lied to yourselves, you poor things. You have always had the choice not to stand. You have known this. It is not knowledge that you lack. You know how to change the world. And it's not by sitting there watching my dumb, sweaty face. Turn this video off and go to your friends. Turn this video off and go to your town halls and talk about real, material things that you can do to improve your communities. Start mutual aid funds. Counter-protest fascists in the streets and online. Plant community gardens. Do anything but waste your finite life watching a 35-year-old man scream at a camera in his living room. Turn this video off! And that's my Howard Beale impression. Wow, that is draining. Wow. Everything that has, that was discussed about television in that movie has happened, except we haven't killed anybody on the air yet. That's the only thing that hasn't happened, deliberately. Sydney, it came true before the movie ever came out.
One name must be said when talking about network, and it must be said carefully. And that name is Christine Chubbuck. I will show only this still image of her, since footage of her is famously hard to find. And the most famous footage of her is her own death. Christine Chubbuck was a reporter for the ABC affiliate channel WXLT-TV in Sarasota, Florida. She suffered from severe depression and suicidal ideation. She did not approve of WXLT's exploitative journalism practices. And on July 15th, 1974, she came to work. Okay, everyone, we're getting close. Her life story would be dramatized in this 2016 film, where she was played by Rebecca Hall. She read some national news stories, then introduced a local story about a shooting at a restaurant. When the film of the story jammed, Christine, on live television, did this. In keeping with the WZRB policy and complete reports of local blood and guts, TV30 presents what is believed to be a television first. In living color and exclusive coverage, of an attempted suicide. She had written the whole report, planned it. She even wrote the report on her own death to be read aloud by whatever anchor would replace her. The story spread the old fashioned way by a word of mouth. Hey, did you hear about that reporter who shot herself on live TV? You know, wild, right? There's no concrete proof that the tragedy of Christine Chubb directly inspired Network, but. According to David Itzkoff's Mad as Hell, The Making of Network, and The Fateful Vision of the Angriest Man in Movies, one draft of the script had Beale declare that he, quote, will blow my brains out right on the air, like that girl in Florida. That line didn't make the final cut. But I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. Actress Caitlin Scheel would tell Chubbuck's story in a more metatextual way in the mockumentary Kate Plays Christine. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. In it, Caitlin Scheel plays herself as she prepares to play Christine Chubbuck in a film. You have to tell me why you want to see it. And in a moment of self-reflexiveness, I've usually only seen in Iranian New Wave films... If you want me to do it, you have to tell me why you want to see it. Kate ends up breaking the reality of the film and interrogates why anyone would want to exploit Chubbuck's death. I can't think of anything. I keep trying to turn her into a hero, but she wasn't. She was just one sad, lonely, pathetic woman, and so am I, but at least I'm still alive. So if you want to see me do this, you have to tell me why you want to see it. I keep looking for an angle to make her death worth more than her life, and there just isn't one. There just isn't one. So if you want to see me do it, you have to tell me why. Give me a f***ing reason! Let's remember that. Let's remember that underneath all the anger on TV, all the anger on the internet, all the anger in mimicry or mockery of this fictional character, a fictional character potentially bred of a real tragedy, that anger sprung from a massive well of despair. Since this show was the only thing I had going for me in my life, I have decided to kill myself. The tragedy of Howard Beale and the tragedy of Christine Chubbuck are the same. They needed help. They needed kindness. They needed community. Instead, the massive machinery of mass media swallowed their images and turned them into hollow spectacle. There was a genuine mental toll for those who study media, those who make media, those who report on tragedy and are expected to move through life dispassionately in spite of it. There are those who spread hate into the world, just there are those who are inflicted with that hate. People on all sides of media. Remember the people. And more importantly, let's remember what media is. It's from Latin, meaning in the center of the medium. Media is the thing in the middle of us. It's just another way to reach people, a form of communication. Television, the internet, all art, all communication, it's the thing that happens between people. And it's people who will always, always, always 
hold the true power in the world. To quote the poet, The revolution will not be right back after a message about a white tornado, white lightning, or white people. You will not have to worry about a dove in your bedroom, the tiger in your tank, or the giant in your toilet bowl. The revolution will not go better with coke. The revolution will not fight germs that may cause bad breath. The revolution will put you in the driver's seat. The revolution will not be televised. Will not be televised. Will not be televised. Will not be televised. The revolution will be no rebound, brothers. The revolution will be live. Now, far be it from me to white-splain Gil Scott Heron's poem, so I'll let him explain it. Well, you know, the, the, the catchphrase, what that was all about, uh, the revolution will not be televised, that was about the fact that the first change that takes place is in your mind. You have to change your mind before you change the way you live and the, and the way you move. So when we said that the revolution will not be televised, we were saying that, like, that, that, that the thing that's going to change people it's something that no one will ever be able to capture on film. It'll just be something that you see and all of a sudden you realize, I'm on the wrong page. Or I'm on the right page, but I'm on the wrong note. And I've got to get in sync with everyone else to understand what's happening in this country. So when Heron wrote that the revolution will not be televised, he meant that true change could not be televised. The medium of television was insufficient to capture it. A medium with that much oversight and dependence on advertisement could not portray true change, and the revolution will be live, remains true. Change does not happen on this tiny little screen. It happens in the heart and mind of the person watching that screen. But the question then follows, is the internet a sufficient enough medium to capture the revolution? The revolution will be live, but does that mean it can be live streamed? Well, live is a frightening thing to witness online. Everyone on this planet above a certain age saw two skyscrapers collapsing on live TV. Harassment campaigns are live, surely. Mass shootings have been live streamed. Surely every moment you spend online is live. Every post, every reply, every argument is live. Getting into arguments online, there's a trap. It's certainly not any way to create new knowledge. An online argument is just a game of anger chicken where the two of you infuriate each other to the point where one of you breaks the terms of service and gets banned. Anger. Anger is the great driving force of mass media. The network heads knew it, and so do the great algorithms of social media, rewarding our rage against our enemies and so conquering our time. And all the algorithms do is just respond to human behavior, and human behavior is addicted to anger. And I can tell that just by looking at the videos I made with the most engagement. My most watched videos have been the ones that anger people. Anonymous and my anti-anti-Stratfordian rant. There's my anti-D.W. Griffith screed, which is full of people in the comments saying, No, this is an important movie. You can't tell me not to watch it. Mm. I'm not telling you not to watch it. I give you reasons at the end. It's in the title of the... And then there's my video essay, which blew up recently, about the documentary For All Mankind, which has attracted the most obnoxious form of commenter, the conspiracy theorist. Conspiracy theorists are not worth entertaining. That is an antenna, not a wire holding the astronaut up. If it was a wire, that it would bend at the point of connection to the astronaut because it was supporting his whole weight. It, but obviously it doesn't. It's a f***ing antenna. Of course everything seems like a conspiracy if you don't understand how anything works. And I have... No. No, I, I don't... I don't want to make myself angry over videos I've already made. It's an easy cycle to enter. Some stranger gets mad at you, and then you get mad at yourself for putting so much time and effort into a video that are just that's just going to make more people angry, and that's going to attract more anger, and it eats your soul. It eats everyone's soul. <sighs> My therapist once told me that anger was the emotion of self-defense. It is the body rising up and saying, I am me. I am worth protecting. Well, protecting from what? 
Anger is also easy to direct, and very easy to misdirect towards an intended victim. I don't need to tell you how many people have been unalived, as people have to say now, because their very existence has made someone mad as hell, and because he was armed and ready, decided that he wasn't going to take it anymore. The rhetoric of anger is just something that we should recognize. Far better than a rhetoric of anger is a rhetoric of mindful action, a rhetoric of community, a rhetoric of shared vulnerability. And what could I have to say about that? Well, I majored in theater. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard-favored rage. Then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow or it, as fearfully as to the galled rock or hang and jutty as confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide. Hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. Said Shakespeare's Henry V giving his soldiers acting advice. Remember that these are all performances. We are all actors playing the parts of pundits. Peter Finch died before the film's release and made history as the first actor to win the Academy Award for Best Lead Performance posthumously. And what a beautiful, sad character he created. Howard Beale... You never lived, and yet I mourn you. I mourn that your story ended with you rolling back into despair, telling the story of dehumanization without the hope of a better world. I mourn that you were martyred for the sake of increasing the wealth of a small group of people in a boring room. What a terrible pun you are. A martyred prophet, martyred for profit. And I mourn that the lesson so many took from your story, including me, is that anger, anger in itself, is engagement. That anger in itself is action. That anger in itself is the end instead of the start. And I wish I had learned that lesson sooner. Us clowns on this tube of yours are ultimately performers. Never forget that. Of course, these performances are meant to stir emotion within you. We want to stir emotion with you. We want you to care about people who are being hurt. We want you to be angry that the world is being destroyed so a tiny few can reap the profits. We want to shock you into action against systems that oppress. We want you to see the injustices we see and get mad. We want you to be mad as hell. But that's the easy part. That's the easy part. Getting mad as hell is easy. The true challenge, the challenge that will last lifetimes, is not taking it anymore.